Our scripture today comes from John 13, 34 and 35, 1 John 4, 7 through 16, the New Revised Standard Version. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another. God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as a Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Here ends the reading of today's scripture. May it hold something in your heart. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning. I must first say thank you to Pastor Chuck Blaisdell and the leadership and congregation here at First Christian Church for welcoming me into their fold and allowing the opportunity to present this sermon. I also must thank my family and friends who have traveled to Colorado Springs, lending support and sharing yourselves with me in this special occasion. I especially thank my wife, Shari, for her unconditional love and support. It's always appreciated and exceeded by no one. Still, above all else, all honor, thanks, and praises are given to God. In the French composer, George Bizet's opera Carmen, Spanish soldier Don Jose is seduced into believing that the beautiful gypsy Carmen is all of what he imagines the fullness of love truly to be. The love that he has found, at least in his mind, is so strong and complete that ultimately his blindness to it not only destroys himself, but the focus of his love, Carmen. How beautiful the opera is on stage, yet how tragic the story. During the summer of 2013, Shari and I decided to take a vacation to France. And while there, we would spend a week in Paris. Paris is a city to which belongs many nicknames. Two of the most popular and frequently used are the City of Light, and my favorite, I'm sure almost everyone else's favorite, the City of Love. We had both traveled to Paris before, yet we had never been there together. So the plan that I concocted was not only to enjoy the sights and sounds Paris has to offer, but also for us to leave in the city of love a lasting symbol of our love. Next to the Louvre Museum in Paris, where Leonardo da Vinci's timeless painting and symbol of love and beauty, the Mona Lisa, hangs, is a bridge over the Seine River. The proper name of the bridge is the Pont des Arts. However, over time, it has been become known as the Love Lock Bridge. Through the years, lovers visiting Paris have pilgrimed <clears throat> to the Love Lock Bridge with love locks in hand for the purposes of attaching them to the fencing and making thus symbolically secure their love in no better place than the city of love. Shari and I were no different because after all, a love acknowledged in the city of love surely would never fail. For on each return to Paris, we would forever be reminded of the context of what love really is. So yes, we attached, inscribed with both of our names and the symbol of a heart representing love, a padlock to the love lock bridge. And as millions before us had already done, we then tossed the key into the scene, ensuring the love lock could never be opened and thus our love be compromised. Some eight months later, <laughs> I returned to Paris for work. Traveling alone, I took the stroll from my hotel to the love lock bridge so that I could take a picture of our love lock and text it back home to Shari. She would be able to share in the joy of seeing that our emblem of love had lasted through the winter and that as new lovers arrived in Paris during the spring, they would be inspired by our singular expression of love. Being a pilot by profession, I had previously plotted the exact location 
of our love lock on the bridge so that I could easily return to it. I walked onto the love lock bridge, passing constellations of love locks to the exact location of where I had attached our eternal expression of love. As I approached, I reached into my pocket for my smartphone for picture taking. I looked up and I did not see our love lock. The section of the love lock bridge fencing where we had placed our love lock had been removed. Plywood had replaced <laughs> the fencing, leaving no trace of our love lock. The fencings on each side of where I stood still had their love locks attached, so in a panic, I went to each section reasoning that I must have miscalculated my initial coordinates. Our love lock was special, and there was no way that out of all of the sections of the love lock bridge's fencing, ours could be the one missing. I even looked over at other bridges on the scene, but quickly accepted the grim reality that indeed I was in the right place with the correct coordinates and that my nav navigational skills were still intact. And yes, our love lock was indeed gone. What had happened? Had the weight of the locks caused the fencing to fall into the river? Had someone determined that our love was not worthy and therefore removed it? Or was this a message from the heavens laughing at our foolishness, saying, no, love does not always endure? Had Shari and I been so naive in believing otherwise? By holding so tightly to the symbol of what the world had told us true love was, were we to share in the same tragedy as Don Jose and Carmen. Now I need to provide a disclaimer and say yes, we are provided with the beautiful definitions of love as found in the Greek words of agape, phileo, storge, and eros. I am not in any way discounting them. However, I ask your patience in traveling with me the scriptural path I've chosen for today. What exactly is love, or at least is one of the manifestations of love? Perhaps the most important is found in scripture, where 1, where 1 John 4, verses 8 and 16 together tell us, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Love is a name commonly shared by both God and the city of Paris. But do they really share it? Or is it perhaps more than just a name for God? I would argue that they are much different, having little in common. According, according to scripture, the very essence or being of God is love. What exactly does this mean for us? First of all, if God is eternal and God is love, then love is eternal. When we attach ourselves to God and not to cities or fences or you fill in the blanks, then, we, then indeed we are connecting with, with what is truly the essence of love. God is not frail and will never fail or buckle under the weight associated with our attachments. You see, our scripture further tells us whoever lives in love lives in God 
and God in them. Now, these are all wonderful and comforting assurances, but what exactly should it mean for us today as we live out our lives? In the Gospel of John, in Jesus' instructing his disciples of whom we are included, he makes clear our responsibility to God, a.k.a. love, with these words. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We are always to treat one another in a godly fashion. Quite simply, that means with love. Let's also be clear that Jesus is not speaking only about loving those we find to the left and right of us or our members of our immediate families. Yes, Jesus is speaking on behalf of more than just you and I. Jesus is being inclusive of the whole of God's human creation. This means that we have to live out the capacity that is within us to love everyone as completely as God loves us. We must love the person or persons who we have our most bitter disagreements with. Such a love is manifest not in the belittling or demonizing of another, but instead of choosing to at least see from their perspective. Love demands that we give up a bit of ourselves to sometimes be in service to a homeless sister or brother struggling on streets that are often treacherous at best. This could mean inviting someone out of the cold and into your home for a warm meal and even a place to shelter for the night. Love does not turn a blind eye to and thus, say, and thus away from any systems of oppression that finds too many young men and, men and women from marginalized communities trapped unfairly in a criminal justice system that holds profit over justice as its guiding principle, nor standing by as educational and vocational opportunities become less available to the poor and almost exclusively in the reach of the wealthy and privileged. You just might have to stand with and advocate on behalf of those whom our society has managed to marginalize. And no, and no, love means not being intimidated or afraid to lock arms with those who come from a land different from ours, regardless of if they speak the same language or call God by the same name as you and I. You see, Jesus treated the Samaritan woman at the well with the same respect, care, dignity, and love as he treated his very own disciples. If you are questioning or unsure of my accuracy, then I humbly direct you to Jesus' own voice in our Gospels. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. God's love is well capable of easily bearing the weight of our attachments. Now, to finish the story of Shari and I's Love Lock adventure in Paris, I have to report in case you haven't already noticed, that yes, our love has survived the loss and removal of our fragile emblem of love. And yes, it is stronger than ever. As a matter of fact, I learned that last summer the legislators in Paris have directed that all of the locks be removed since they had become an eyesore in the city of love and danger to lovers passing below the bridge in boats. We know 
that God's love is never an eyesore or danger. Therefore, the question I leave you with is will you, in all of your earthly and spiritual being, choose God? Will you completely choose love?